Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Larry Butler for the East Hawaii Cultural Center, and I think it's a good time to start off. And thank you, folks, for joining us. How nice uh, for this wonderful talk we're anticipating by Stacy Brining from the Hawaii Wildlife Fund. Stacy, so much, uh, we're so much grateful to you for, for coming and speaking with us. Uh, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund is an essential partner in our current exhibition, current events, in fact, of ocean debris curated by Andre Kramars. Uh, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund collected the plastic that is now filling our gallery and has been cooperating with the uh, EHCC for good God, two years now, putting this together. We're so grateful to have uh, Stacy Brining talking to us today. Stacy works as an environmental educator with the Hawaii Wildlife Fund's Hawaiian Coastal Ecosystems and Marine Debris Keiki Education and Outreach Programs. She visits island schools, teaching students about Hawaii's native wildlife and how we can be stewards of the environment that we all depend on. After graduating from West Hawaii Explorations Academy in Kailua Kona, she attended the University of Hawaii in Hilo. Stacy began volunteering with the Hawaii Wildlife Fund in 2009 and graduated with a bachelor's degree in marine science the following year with a thesis project focusing on removing invasive tilapia fish from ankyline pools. She's passionate about teaching our keiki how to respect themselves and protect our natural resources. When she isn't helping to remove marine debris or invasive plant species from the coastline, she is supporting the Hawaii Wildlife Fund's social media and marketing efforts, photographing orchids or hanging out with her two kids, Nico and Araceli. Stacy, thank you so much for being here. And I turn this over to you. Oh, a reminder, I'm sorry. Um, Chat. If, if you want to add questions during the chat, we'd love to have them and we'll deal with them at the end. There. Ah, Stacy, thank you so much. Now I turn it over to you. Thank you, Larry. What a pleasure it is to be here. You can hear me okay? Everyone can hear me? Beautiful. Okay? Awesome. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you so much for, be, for being here, all of you, and, and listening to what we have to say. Um, I'm going to screen share here. I have a PowerPoint presentation to go through with you all. So give me just a moment to get that going and we'll begin. All right. All righty. Beautiful. Great, thank you. All right, so here we are. Um, Today, the title of my talk, or Hawaii Wildlife Fund's talk, I should say, is Plastic Pollution, Stories of Recovery, Reduction, and Lessons Learned from Ka'u. Um, the photograph that you see here on the cover page is quite a telling one of our story with marine debris. Um, the beach doesn't quite look like that anymore. Over the years, we've picked it up a lot, but this is very shocking and, and a regular sight near Camilo. Um, Today, this is our, our outline. I'm going to introduce who Hawaii Wildlife Fund is. I'm gonna kind of zoom out a little bit and present some global statistics and trends. I'm going to then talk about our recovery efforts, get into marine debris, some of the nitty gritty about, about it and, and the plastic pollution that it is. Um, and then talk about prevention, education and outreach and um, policies and things that we have been doing in efforts to kind of curb this issue. So here we go. So here we are. This is our Hawaii Wildlife Fund team on the Hawaii, Hawaii Island. We have a team on Maui also. Um, but first I'll tell you that Hawaii Wildlife Fund was uh, co-founded by Hannah Bernard and Bill Gilmartin. They're at the bottom left of your screen there um, in 1996. And um, we've come together over these years with the overarching mission to protect our native wildlife. And we do that through research, education, and conservation projects. Um, like I said, you can check out all the faces of our Hawaii Island team with a couple of Maui people poking in there. And then these are our most recent Hawaii Island team members, which we're so happy to have, um, Bev, Mike, and Jody. You may recognize them, you may not but they're amazing. We're all biologists, educators, um, and just overall team members in this mission to protect our wildlife. 
Um, Hawaii Wildlife Fund has hmm, half a dozen at least different projects between the two islands. Um, today, obviously, I'm going to be focusing on marine debris, um, but we do have um, ties to monk seals with our co-founder Bill Gilmartin, who is kind of like the godfather of monk seals, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and we also have, we, we work directly with wildlife on Maui doing the Honuea, the Hawksbill, the Endangered Hawksbill Sea Turtle Project, Recovery Project. And we also have been doing um, coastal ecosystem restoration work here on the island, um, working with anchialine pools and those very unique habitats, uh, removing invasive plants, things like that. And then we've been doing our education and outreach for uh, quite a handful of years now, um, focusing on marine debris prevention and awareness and also our coastal ecosystems program. But like I said, today we're gonna to be focusing on marine debris. Um, unfortunately, it affects all of our projects. Um, it is, and you'll see why here. So um, our oceans connect us all. Here we are looking at the Pacific Ocean, um, Hawaii right there in the heart. And um, historically, we've gotten a lot of marine debris off of the ocean because of where we're located. Um, you can see we're pretty close there to the Eastern Garbage Patch or the North Pacific Subtropical High. Um, and then just in combination with the way that our islands are, here's the entire archipelago, excuse me, archipelago. I can't even say it right now. You know what I mean. You can read it. So our islands are acting like a sieve there. So with the, the way the ocean currents are going, which are clockwise direction um, with the onshore winds, they kind of, the islands just act like a comb and with just getting lots of debris washing up onto our shores. Um, we've found debris from all over the Pacific Basin. So it's not just you know, Japan or China or California or Alaska or Mexico. It's everybody. Um, what is marine debris? Well, marine debris is um, defined as any man-made object that has made its way into the ocean. Um, that can be lumber, wood, which is a natural but treated resource. And then we've also got anything, everything you can think of that's plastic. Um, it, it's washed ashore. Tires, laundry baskets, propane cylinders, gas containers, water bottles, reusable water bottles, disposable water bottles, you name it. Um, and a we get a lot of microplastics also, which is that bottom left-hand corner there, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, we all, all of us that work for Hawaii Wildlife Fund have small little collections of treasures that we've found on the beach. Um, I have quite a collection of uh, these army men here. The, some are decapitated and missing heads or all of their limbs. And it's just fun to, to find those little treasures along the way, considering it's such a serious issue. Um, unfortunately, majority of what washes ashore, we can't identify. Um, you're looking here north towards Camilo Point. Um, Camilo Point is there in the distance. And this is kind of what a typical beach cleanup might look like these days. Um, you can, if you look closely, you can see a couple different tide lines there um, characterized by the swashing of the microplastics. So little white and blue speckled um, along the shoreline there. You can see the low tide mark there where there's a lot of trash. Um, sometimes we can identify like this shampoo bottle from China. Um, sometimes we get local trash like this, um, you know, whole license plate that had a valid registration when it washed up, surprisingly. Um, and the majority of the time it's things like this bolt hole where we can't, we can tell it was part of a boat, we can't tell where it was from or who it belonged to or anything like that. Um, so kind of interesting. And sometimes we find fun little treasures like glass floats. Um, fortunately, I've found one. That's the one I have found over the last <laughs> 12 years. Um, but they're always fun, fun to wash up. They, they do still wash up. Um, so marine debris is a global problem, right? It's not 
just one area's problem. Um, I'm gonna give you all some statistics here in a minute that might make you think, oh, it's their problem or their problem, but really it's a global problem, but it has local solutions. Um, and we'll get into some of those here as we get started. Um, so here we go for some data, Are you guys ready? Um, so this is from a cumulative global plastics production. So this is all the plastics that's been produced, you can see since the 1950s. So on the bottom axis there, we have years, and then we have tons, billions of tons on the Y axis there. And as you can see, since, since the 60s, 50s, 60s, we've been exponentially producing this stuff. Um, 275 million metric tons of plastic was generated in 192 coastal countries. And they said in this article that about 4.8 to 12.7 million metric tons have been have entered the ocean. That's pretty shocking. Um, this is a quick little video that I'm not gonna play right now, but I normally play this when I go into the classroom to kind of give the kids a better idea of the history of plastic and how it's changed our world. So I posted this in the group chat um, before we got started. So you can go ahead and copy and paste that out into YouTube, or you could just take a picture of your screen and get the title and search it later and watch it. It's six minutes, um, just under six minutes, but it's very informative. Um, can you remember what life was like before plastic? <laughs> I can't. Some, some people who are watching this might, might remember. Um, let's see, move that out of my way there. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. So there was uh, Schmidt et al. in 2017 did a study and they were checking out. They wanted to know more about where all this trash was coming from. Um, and they were able to figure out that rivers from the top 10 catchments contribute to 88 to 94% of plastics in the world's oceans, six of them being in Asia and two of them in Africa. Now, this is one of the statistics that might make you think, oh, well, it's Asia's problem and we're over here pointing our fingers at Asia, but really up until a few years ago, where were we sending all of our recycling to Asia? So who's to say that <laughs> That wasn't mismanaged U.S. recycling that's washing out of those river catchments. It's really hard to say. So um, just be really mindful about wanting to blame somebody about this problem because really it's a it's a human problem. Where there are humans, there's marine debris and there's plastic pollution. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay, so Hawaii Wildlife Fund was involved in this study and it was really interesting because um, they were able to see um, kind of where the different types of plastics were washing up. And they were able to see that certain plastics like the harder ones, twos and fives and the things that float. So let me back up just a quick second. For those that don't know, I'm sure most of you do though. There are different types of plastics and they're characterized by the numbers on the bottom. There's like a number on the bottom of a container and um, they're characterized by the different types of chemicals that they use because right, some are soft, some are hard. So we're seeing that the hard ones are washing up on the windward side and the leeward side of the islands are getting more lighter trash, like the, the expanded polystyrene or the cigarette butts or, you know, you, beach user trash. Um, and just to kind of give you a better visual of that, why isn't that button working? There we go. Um, so on the Kona side, we're seeing more, you know, polystyrene beach goer trash. And on the Hilo side and the south side, we're seeing more of those hard plastics that are washing in from the ocean. And then also, Sorry, I'm gonna move everyone's faces out of my way so I can see the screen, there we go. Um, we're also seeing like the, the number sevens, which is kind of like the catch-all plastic for the, we're not quite sure what kind of plastic it is. Um, we're seeing those also on the leeward sides. All right. All right, so why do we care about marine debris at Hawaii Wildlife Fund? Um, well, we care because it is a threat to our marine life. As you can see from these photos, we have wildlife that are getting entangled in, our, in, in these large nets. We're seeing, um, we're seeing uh, birds and actually there, there was a study in 2015 that uh, they, 
they were able to identify 690 different species of marine life that had been interacting with wildlife. Um, excuse me, yeah, that had been interacting with marine debris, excuse me. So they're finding the stuff in their guts. Um, yeah, which is a heavy thing to think about because it looked like they, they filleted that fish and they probably ate it, which means that we're probably eating it. Um, and unfortunately, plastic and microplastics are ubiquitous with our environment now all over the world. Um, they're finding it in our sea salt, they're finding it in glaciers, they're finding it in microfibers in the air, in our bottled water. Um, so it's kind of hard to get, to get away from, unfortunately. Um, and this is kind of where I get to tell a fun story about how we really started getting involved with marine debris. So in 2003, um, Bill, our co-founder, Bill Gilmartin, who I mentioned was the godfather of Monk Seals, um, he's one of the people responsible for helping bring that population back from extinction. And so when he retired and was living in Volcano, he got called on the first Monk Seal puppy in here on Hawaii Island, in the main Hawaiian Islands actually, and it was near Camilo Point. So he went out to this very remote area, stumbled upon mountains, tons and tons and tons of trash, plastic that had been accumulating there for, you know, decades at that point. Um, and as he was sitting there week after week, helping monitor the weaning of this pup, um, he decided he was going to do something about it. And um, People at that time, people had just kind of accepted Camilo area as being, you know, trash beach. We don't really like to call it that. Um, it's definitely not, doesn't look like that anymore. But <clears throat> if you can imagine, the beach is I'm being, you know, vague here. I'm not being very precise. But, you know, if the beach is sloped like this, there was so much trash there at that time that the beach looked flat to Bill. <laughs> And when he finally um, rallied up the community and his friends to come down and help him that first weekend, they did a two day weekend and they had heavy machinery down there. They were able to remove 50 tons of marine debris just that first weekend. Bill told people, don't pick up anything smaller than the size of your hand, which is kind of a weird thought to think of because you're like, if I'm going to a beach cleanup, I'm picking everything up that I see. But if you really understood the, the vastness of trash here, then it, you would understand what I'm saying. It's just, it's really hard to just, okay, why am I picking up this one piece? Well, in that weekend's case, it was because it was bigger than the size of their hand. Nowadays, we're not doing that. Um, we, when you pull up to the beach, it looks fairly clean compared to how it used to be. Um, but now you gotta look closer and you can see the smaller microplastics. And that's been what we've been um, focusing on these last couple years or so. Um, this is just an interesting piece of literature um, that you can kind of screenshot there and take a look at if you want. Um, but basically what it was saying, what it is saying is that not only is plastic um, polluting, it, plastic is polluting our environment every step of the way in its production and then also then when we incinerate it. And this is, this article is saying that pretty soon we're going, the emissions from burning plastics and an incinerator is going to um, exceed that of coal burning. And so on a global scale, that's just something to, to keep in mind there. Um, all right, so I'm gonna kind of bring it back to Hawaii here a little bit. Um, this is a photo, a local photo um, by our friend Lindsay Kramer and it is an Elkhorn coral that is bleaching. And right in front of it, there is, um, this our native domino damsel fish. And, you know, there's a lot of issues going on right now with climate change and, and, and what humans are doing to our environment. But the marine debris issue is something that we can actually do something about, right? So it's hard to be like, okay, I'm gonna change the temperature or the pH of the ocean so that those corals stop bleaching. We can't do that. We don't have a magic wand, right? It can't be that instantaneous. But today and tomorrow, right now, we can choose wiser choices when we're buying and spending our money on, are we gonna buy something that's got single-use plastic wrapped all over it or we're gonna spend our money on things that are gonna last longer. Um, 
So it's just something to think about there. Um, so we're gonna get into some of our cleanup stats here. So collectively from 98 to 2021, um, us and our partners, we've removed over 360 tons. That's from Hawaii Island, Maui, Midway, and French Frigate Shoals in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So that is our statewide impact, which is pretty impressive if you ask me. Um, our recovery efforts are volunteer powered. We would be abs we would be nowhere without our volunteers. Um, ninety five percent of our efforts are volunteer power, um, and we have over we've amassed over forty seven thousand documented volunteer hours since two thousand and three, which is impressive. So if you've been on any of our beach cleanups, whether you've been a student in the past or just been an adult coming to volunteer with your family or by yourself with your friends, thank you. Um, you guys are amazing. We would be nowhere without you guys. Um, here's just some, an ode to our volunteers and our beach cleanups. Um, can, we generally do about a, cle a community cleanup a month or so is what it's been averaging and then private cleanups um, thrown in between there. Um, this is a map here of just Hawaii Island and you can see the dark, uh, purpley spots. I don't know what color it comes out for you guys, but the dark spots are all of our cleanup sites around the island. So you can see most of our cleanup has been happening near the South Point, but also a little bit in Kona and Hilo and Hololu. Okay, I believe this is from the mid 2000s, this photo right here. This was like a typical looking beach cleanup when I first started working in 2009. And we have, like I was saying, um, lots of beach cleanups with school groups, uh, younger kids with, and then also even some of our college students at um, the community. College. We have lots of fun. These are pre-COVID days, obviously. Um, on average, our volunteers collect just over 80 pounds each per cleanup. Um, and to date, just on Hawaii Island, we've removed just over 308 tons of marine debris, just from this island. And the majority of that from near South Point. Um, we also do net recovery patrols. Um, and if you get a chance to come check out the current events exhibition here, you'll see how big and crazy looking these net bundles are. Um, this one, as you can see, is very colorful. So we've got probably a dozen at least different nets and lines all kind of tangled up there together. You can see how massive this one was um, washed up on Bayfront a few years ago. So we have, thanks to Bill, um, our fearless leader, he has rigged up this amazing system to get these big, huge nets off of the coastline. Um, and this was our first rig right here. This is Blondie. We've affect affectionately called her Blondie. Um, we have a logging hook connect connected to a winch at the top of the back of the vehicle. And I'll you can see it better. And this is our current setup. This is Ruby, everyone meet Ruby. Um, she's a horse, but you can see on the top, she's got the winch and this edition has a uh, inserted dump bed. So we can, and then there's a ramp on it. So we take our logging hook, grab a hold of the big nets, and then we use our winch to, to roll it up over itself into the truck. And then once you get to the transfer station where we have our net staged, um, we are able to dump it out easy. So we're working smarter, not harder to get those nets into the truck and out of the, out of the environment. Um, we store them at Waihinu Transfer Station. Thank you graciously to the County of Hawaii for letting us do that. Um, and we have been using them to send and be a part of this Hawaii Nets to Energies program. So basically it's a partnership between NOAA, Kavanta Energy, H Power, and Matson, and small community partners like Hawaii Wildlife Fund. Um, and over the years, we have sent 13 containers, 40 foot containers full of nets 
Um, about 100 tons of net is equal to powering 43 homes a year. So we've done just over 100 tons of nets. Um, we've sent them to Oahu to burn. Now we understand, we, we know that that's not the best way to get rid of them, um, but at least some way the energy is being used still a little bit. Even It's, it's tough because we're, you know, we're on an island. We have a finite amount of space in our landfill. So we needed to do something else with it besides throw all these tons into our already full bulging landfill. Um, so if you have any better ideas, please reach out and let us know. Um, and then the microplastics, like I had mentioned before, we're, we're done getting all those big pieces and now we're, we're looking into getting these small micro pieces out of the environment. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about plastic, just in case you don't know anything. Um, it doesn't biodegrade. We don't even like to say that it breaks down. We like to say that it breaks up into a bunch of tiny pieces because once it's plastic, it never goes away. It can't biodegrade, right? Um, and simply because um, the chemicals and heat that they use to create it just doesn't exist in nature. So um, there's nothing that can heat it up hot enough to get rid of it in nature. Um, so we had some engineering students from the University of Sherbrooke reach out to us and we worked together with them for a couple of years to design this microplastics machine, which we then um, crowdfunded to get from there to here. And um, we found that it's 97% effective at removing the microplastics up to 40 microns from the sand. So basically, as you can see, um, we got Megan here in the top right hand corner and she's sucking up the sand there. And then it goes through the machine there's like a little float tank in there where it floats in seawater, the, the plastics float, and then they're able to sieve that off and then spit out clean sand. So it's quite, quite a fun little machine. Let me move my pictures again here. Sorry about that. Um, so this is just a graph of data that we have um, from over the years. <clears throat> So on the bottom, we have years, and then on the top, or on the x-axis, we've got, I'm sorry, excuse me, the y-axis, we've got um, the weight removed, um, non-net being the orange, and then net bundles, net weight being the blue. Um, let's see here. That line indicates when the tsunami the tragic tsunami happened in 2011 in Japan. Um, we thought maybe we'd see, you know, a pulse of debris and we sort of did. However, if you look at the data closely, um, and I think my next graph shows it really well, but basically we've been cleaning up more over the years. So of course we're picking up more. If we're, do, we're out there more often, we're gonna have more debris removed. Um, this is actually just an ode here to some of our funders over the years. We have been funded from uh, by NOAA Marine Debris Program for, for many, many years. There have been gaps in there, though, where we have um, depended on our community and smaller organizations for private funding and, and stuff like that. And that's, that's how we've kind of kept things going. So this is the graph that I was talking about here, where you can see on the bottom how many cleanups we did for each of those years. So in 2008, we did six cleanups. In 2016, we did 38, you know, um, and then we got to 2017, um, we did see kind of a pulse of debris coming in, um, but we also started cleaning up weekly, sometimes more than, than um, once a week. So of course we're gonna have higher numbers there. Um, this just shows that the density of marine debris that we've picked up um, over the years, just kind of reiterating our work and effectiveness in the South Kau district. So yellow being the highest density of marine debris that we've removed, purple being low. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of our marine debris survey line. So I believe it was in 2016, we started collecting data kind of um, similarly to some of our partners out there. So we can kind of 
you know, gauge how accumulation is happening for us over here, accumulation of marine debris. So we've got a hundred meter, hundred meters long, um, about 10 meters wide. So basically from the, wherever the, the, the water line is all the way up to the higher high tide line, we were sweeping this hundred meter zone, collecting everything bigger than two and a half centimeters and cataloging everything, counting everything and trying to get a good snapshot of what is washing up there. Um, we've done 50 surveys, an average of 2,000, just over 2,000 pieces of marine debris. Um, and we're finding that 90, almost 95% of it is, is plastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is a photo before one of our surveys. And here it is after, leaving only um, small pieces of glass and driftwood. And then you can see in the left side there, I'm gonna kind of toggle back and forth so that you can catch it with your eye. Somebody ended up burning um, that net pile there. And so it, it was there for a while, kind of melted into the, to the sand. We don't recommend doing that. Um, obviously they release a lot of chemicals and it's, it's very difficult to clean up. So don't do that. And here's another photo of our survey line on a very, very clean day. Okay, this is just reiterating that 90, almost 95% of, of the debris that we're picking up in the survey is plastic. Okay, and then here are, we've got dates, the dates of our 50 surveys there along the bottom on the x-axis and then on the y-axis we've got um, number numbers, uh, pieces of, of debris that we have picked up. Um, we're starting to see kind of some seasonal trends where we've got like an uptick in debris in the spring and early summer, and then kind of a lull of not, so, not as much coming in during the winters. And as you can see over time, it has definitely been going down and was helping Megan at our last, on the 50th one, and it was the second to lowest amount of debris that we've had. Um, in the whole time we've been doing it. So just interesting to know. We'll have more solid data on that soon, but that's just kind of some prelim unpublished preliminary data. Um, so our grad student, Mike Stone, hey Mike, he's here watching. He um, helped us with a brand audit of the debris that we were finding down at Camilo. So basically we we're trying to figure out how Okay, so beach cleanups basically are attacking the marine debris problem, but from the bottom up, right? It's just grassroots, community, people that care going and, and, and doing something about it, right? But it's sort of like pushing wet spaghetti up a hill. Somebody I don't like told me that one time, and it made me mad because it's, ugh, it is like pushing wet spaghetti up a hill. It doesn't really do much unless we turn off the tap, right? Unless we stop it from getting in the ocean in the first place. And so this brand's audit was um, a step in that direction. Um, Mike cataloged all of the different brands that we found that we continue to find over the years. And you're looking at uh, the size of the brand that you see, the, the lettering is indicative of how often we found it. So the Nestle, we found a lot of Nestle, a lot of toothbrushes, Oral-B toothbrushes, Nescafe. Um, and you can check and see if there's any, I see Paul Mitchell just, you know, kind of help put into perspective how often we're, we're finding things. And, and hopefully we can take that information then and start attacking it from the, this problem from the top down, right? Hey, Nestle, check out all of your caps that we've found on the beach over the last two years. Help us do something about it or stop making it, something like that. So thanks for all your hard work, Mike. Um, and here's just kind of a snapshot of some of the things that we've found. And something to keep in mind too, when you're thinking about all these brands is that a lot of them, Sorry, I'm just gonna skip right over that one. Whoa. Sorry, I lost my train of thought because that's not the order I thought I was going in there. But basically we only, um, we're English speakers here. So we were able to recognize 
um, a lot of the brands that were in English and that we could identify. So it kind of limited us in a certain way, but um, here's kind of a snapshot of all the reoccurring countries of origin from the brands audit that Mike did. Okay, and then um, at the top here, just above Nestle, um, on that y-axis there, you see a Euro cap. And we recently, interestingly, we think it, that they all of these caps just started showing up um, from a container spill or something, but basically we found thousands and thousands of caps that go on like two liter bottles with like unopened, completely brand new clear caps. Um, and in the past, we've seen things like a bunch of hangers washed up in this one cove. We found dozens and dozens of them. For a month we saw them and it was weird things like that happen all the time too. So we just gotta keep that in mind as we're looking at this data. And then this is where I was going with the brands is that you see a handful of brands, but really what you don't know is that behind the scenes, they really are connected to Nestle or PepsiCo. And these um, I circled or we circled some of the main brands that we saw. So Kellogg's, PepsiCo, Nestle, and Coca-Cola. Um, Hawaii Wildlife Fund is also working closely um, on this marine debris action plan with um, statewide partners. Um, several goals there that you can see underneath the action plan status. Um, you can go ahead and, and read that in more depth, but basically we've been involved in this pretty intimately over the years. So we can all kind of stay on the same page and make sure that we're not all just like working in a vacuum and doing our own thing that we think is right and not getting anywhere, right? Working together. We always say teamwork makes the dream work. So that's what we're doing. Um, over the years, these, and this isn't all of them, um, but these are a good amount of people that we have, that have been supporting our marine debris program. So we've got government agencies, we've got very small businesses, non, other nonprofits. Um, yeah, I'm sure you see some brands up there that you do know, and it's good to know that they are supporting organizations like ours and doing keeping marine debris off the off the coastline. Um, these are some of the local policy efforts that we have also put energy into over the years with the, the smoking ban on beaches and the plastic bags and the polystyrene. Um, and then in the future here, um, there's going to be a sweeping single-use plastics bill coming up soon, hopefully. So um, if you're interested in that, then shoot us an email and or reach out to your representatives and nudge them in that direction also. And there's some uh, more information on that. Um, so when you're thinking about marine debris or your plastic consumption, this is the hierarchy of disposal here. You could just do nothing or incinerate it, or you can throw it away, or you can figure out how to reuse it, which is kind of what this cool exhibit is there behind me here at the cultural center. And we're always, um, we always have a good time working with local artists and school groups who wanna use the marine debris for art. We're happy to keep it out of the landfill. <laughs> Um, these are some of the recycling options that we have either pursued or been involved with um, or hope to be involved in in the near future. Um, and then we've also got our marine debris education, outreach, prevention. Um, this is kind of what I'm most passionate about, um, getting in the classroom and <clears throat> having the kids kind of direct and show me you know, how creative they really are in, in dealing with issues like this, kind of serious issues. This is a Girl Scout group that we had worked with on Maui. And then we've got uh, this really fun, um, we call it oh, the Honu in bottle caps there. That is taller than me. Um, and that has gone up and displayed countless events around the island. Um, we've also worked with artists like Pam Lombardi and um, other local artists too. Um, 
So these are our homegirls here. We got Maddie Mae Larson with Upcycle Hawaii and the Nerdle and the Rough Gal um, cat. And they are taking marine debris and keeping it out of our landfill and making treasure out of it. And if you should go check their websites out and support them because the work that they're doing is really great. Um, this is a really cool marine debris sculpture that we also helped um, source the material for. This is the Bruges whale. Um, this thing has made its way through Shanghai and Bruges here and other Euro some other European stops. Might not make it to the US, but definitely a showstopper. And pretty soon we're gonna have some stuff up to present next time about this um, ex exhibition right behind me with the current events here at the East Hawaii Cultural Center. Um, so here is a before and after of Camilo. This is before, after one of our events. Um, obviously there's still a bunch of microplastics there, but just kind of give you an idea of how much trash we're removing. It's a lot. And then that top photo is from the late 80s, early 90s, um, from our friend Noni Sanford, who's done a lot of uh, beach combing and collecting. She's kind of famous for, for her work doing that. Um, but it's quite a stark difference. If, if, you, I, if you don't agree, I, I don't know what's wrong with you, but look at the difference. Um, it's a lot of hard work. I'm proud of the work that we've done with our volunteers. Um, so this is your call to get involved. Um, you're welcome to join us if you're on island for any of these events. Um, if you can't, if you're not here, you're somewhere else joining us from across the Pacific, then you can do your own beach cleanup or adopt your favorite beach or place or park or trail or neighborhood. Um, cause the ocean is downhill from anywhere. And if, even if all you can do is clean your neighborhood, then you're preventing marine debris from getting into, into the environment. And then also, you know, um, really being mindful about how we spend our money. You know, what are you buying at the grocery store? What are you buying at the store? What are your clothes made out of? I mean, those little choices that you do daily do make a difference. It's um, always seems like futile, like, oh, this one bottle. But like, if you're saving a bottle every day of your life, from here on out over time, that's a lot of bottles that you didn't purchase. So you're saving money and you're saving the environment. So bring your bags, bring your reusable water bottle with you, um, and then feel free to reach out to where we're on Instagram and Facebook, and we try our best to, to field people's questions and interests, um, especially if you're like, you know, I can shoot you to like a bunch of zero waste Instagram pages to help inspire you if that's what you want. Okay, you can also visit our website, wildhawaii.org, check out our calendar, see if you wanna join us on Maui for any of our projects over there. And then just remember that the oceans connect us all. <laughs> How can you best protect our oceans? Thank you very much, everybody. Happy to take any questions if you have any. Stacy, thank you so much. That was wonderful and terrifying. Hopefully you're not like uh, overwhelmed into inaction. Hopefully there's still a little spark in there to, you know, there really is something that you can do about it. It's, a, it's not a very good situation, but um, it's something that we have the power to do something about. Mm -hmm. Thank you again so much. Okay, you're welcome. Um, we, we have some questions. Uh, before I forget, I want to thank not only Stace, but also the Hawaii Wildlife Fund, who were just integral in putting together this exhibition at the East Hawaii Cultural Center. Uh, we thank Kona Transit for helping transport all that stuff from Waiohino up to here. Uh, I noticed in the audience, a few of us has actually participated in your little pickups, if only once. Uh, little pickups, I'm kidding there. Um, and of course, thanks to Andre Kramars, our curator, for putting together the exhibition and working with you. So let's see what kind of questions we've got here. Um, 
have you been able to scale the Ho'ola one to handle more microplastics or are you able to get another machine? Um, good question. Um, it, I believe is getting fixed. There was a little held hold up on it and we aren't engineers ourselves, but it sounds like um, we're gonna get it rolling. We haven't been able to scale it. Um, unfortunately, it's just generally really difficult to get to Camilo without a trailer and a machine on top of it. Um, so I think we might be looking for places for it to go where it is, you know, easier access, you know, a beach that you can just drive up to versus having to four wheel drive for 10 hours. Just kidding, it doesn't take that long, but you know, it's very remote. Um, so maybe stay tuned on that and see if we have any exciting news on that in the near future. Mm. I have a question. I'm interested to see that you're helping send trash over to Oahu to the trash to energy plant. It keeps coming up for discussion here in Hilo. Do you think that it's at all feasible in Hilo to have a plant like that? Um, I know that they have, and I don't know ex the exact numbers, but I know there's like a minimum requirement for how much trash you have to have in order to have an incinerator. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure our island produces enough trash for that to be realistic for us. Um, I know Megan would have more to say about it. Um, it's something that we def I don't think that we want on our island um, as far as like, you know, the emissions go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah mm. it seems like a devil's bargain either way yeah i know there's definitely people pushing for it um but i also know that there's pushback against it so yeah i mean i don't know what's better paying money to ship it to oahu i mean because eventually that's going to be our reality too right we're gonna right now we're shipping it from hilo to waikoloa yeah. Talking over. So what what does the future hold for that? It's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I have another question here. Are you seeing any reduction in wildlife entangled in plastics, ghost nets, etc.? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I just from my personal experience, um, my anecdotal experience that, you know, I haven't seen a, a lot of wildlife entangled in marine debris in my personal experiences. I know that it is happening. It's, um, I'm seeing more and more reports of like whales or, or dolphins stuck in nets. So I, I don't know if there's a reduction of that happening. Um, hmm. But it's, it seems to be that there's kind of like this lull in debris right now that's because you saw our, our numbers are going down, right? But mm -hmm. with the, how complex oceanography is and the way that ocean currents go, it's really hard to say like that that's a permanent thing. I don't think that's because the tap's getting turned off. I think that subtropical high is just naturally kind of floating away from us a little bit. So maybe we're seeing less of it come ashore at the moment, but I just have this sinking feeling that soon that's gonna get closer to us and we're just gonna get inundated again. Oof. But I mean, but I don't know. That's just a guess. It's just a guess. Mm. Well, apropos of that, another question. Um, I've read that the pandemic has increased marine debris, discarding one use PPE. Has that been noticed at Camilo? Yep, absolutely. Um, if you go to our Instagram page and you scroll down a little bit, um, I posted a photo not too long ago of a single use white and blue mask right there on the ground. Now, I don't know if that was blown off of somebody's face who was down there or if that washed in, I don't know, but it was in like under the sand, like it kind of got wind and sand all over it and definitely seeing PPE eaten not just at Camilo, which is a remote place, but everywhere. I've been seeing it in all over town. Oh dear. Another question. Um, is there any progress on generating bacteria that can break down plastics? Mm, I haven't heard any. Um, I heard there was like a mushroom that was doing something like that too. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know specifics, sorry. Sorry, Steph. 
Mm-hmm. Somebody wonders, what's the Instagram address, please? Okay, we are at Wild Hawaii. I will type it in. Great. She's typing it into the comments, I think. Oh, wait, just kidding. That went just to Mike Stone. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Everyone. So at Wild Hawaii. Great. Thank you. Are there more questions? These are good. Oh, looks like um, Mike helped me answer a question and he said they made another newer version of the Ho'ola one. Ah. Mike, do you have anything else to add about that? Yeah, um, I, I did a podcast interview with one of the um, chief engineers, um, mm -hmm. his name is John Felix, and the first one that they made was a prototype. It was for their master's program. So um, a few of them that stuck with the project actually made a newer version of it because one of the pro issues that we had was it being so big. There's a photo of Ruby um, towing the whole Ola one on a four wheel drive and we're actually stuck in the sand <laughs> at one point. It just says it's such a big, and it, it weighs around 1500 pounds, you know? And if anyone had been to Camilo who knows the ride, down to Camilo knows it's just not feasible to have essentially a boat <laughs> being uh, towed down. So they made a newer, uh, smaller version that looks, uh, you know, just a V2, they called it. So it looks like it could definitely um, be a little bit more useful than the first one. Not saying that the first one wasn't useful, but yeah. It was effective. It just wasn't realistic for us to bring it down there many, many times. Mm. What do you think about the, um, oh, the much publicized plastic collection vessel that some teen genius invented in Holland and was actually parked in Hilo for a while for repairs? Yeah, um, I, I am not, I apologize, I'm not super up to date on that one. However, I, did know, I do know that they went from being out in the ocean collecting trash to now they are at some of those river catchments catch oh. it before it goes out into the ocean. And I think that's a way more feasible way of cleaning up the ocean. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah. But okay. man, he's got a lot of support from people all over the world. And so that's really cool to see people get behind something like that. It in is inspiring. Hmm. Okay, another question. If there was one thing everyone could do to help, what would that be? If there was one thing that you could do, um, I would really encourage you to just um, evaluate your relationship to plastic. Um, I know that it's really easy to villainize plastic, right? And make it evil. It doesn't biodegrade. It's everywhere. Eh. So easy to do that. Um, but just keep in mind too, like it's a very revolutionary material. It has revolutionized the medical industry. Um, I, I personally have a brother who was in a car accident and if it wasn't for plastic and having one of those tubes down his throat or the tubes coming out, draining his lungs, he would be dead. And I know that there's plenty of people out there who, who you guys might know that have a pacemaker or something, right, that has plastic in it. So it's becoming aware of our relationship to plastic. How are we using it? Are we using it in ways that, are we being wasteful with it? Um, so I, I know that's not like a perfect little answer for you, Eileen, but um, it's, a, it's multifaceted. So what are you doing personally? And then how can you join us or people who are fighting it to attack it from the bottom up and the top down. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So bottom up being beat ups, uh, you know, your personal use and then the top down being like our brands audit or, you know, getting involved with the legislation or, you know, talking to your representatives and voting in people who that is important to them, reducing our waste or that kind of thing. I hope that's helpful. Mm, that's kind of a challenging answer. <laughs> All encompassing. <Sorry. laughs> Do we have more more questions? Seeing no more questions, let me thank you again for 
really fascinating presentation and for helping us broaden the meaning of this exhibition here at the East Hawaii Cultural Center. Um, if you haven't seen the show yet, uh-oh, I think tomorrow's the last day. We're open from 10 until 4. And uh, after that, I'm, you might be pleased to learn that we are going to be recycling as much of the plastic as we can through artists' involvement. And I'm delighted that you mentioned artists and using your waste as one of the, one of the good things to do with it. Uh, so we'll be working on that for the next year or so. Um, beyond that, uh, anybody, I remind you this is recorded. We will be posting it to our YouTube channel. So if you want to see those addresses again or the sponsors again, um, probably just in two or three days we'll have it posted. And how do you get to our YouTube channel? EHCC.org. You'll call up our website and there is a little sidebar that says lecture series. Click on that and you can see this and, in fact, all of our lectures. And, oh, wait a minute, Carol. Oh, Andre says the last day is the 26th. Okay, good, good, good. Um, I'm wrong there. So come see the exhibit. Uh, Carol, if you're there, if you want to put up something about surveys, I never know what to say, but uh, we do always appreciate feedback for these presentations. Ah, and I see some. Ah, am I unmuted this time? Yes. Last time you tried to ask me that question and I answered, but I was on mute, so no one heard me. Um, okay. we, we do have some standard material that Mo, our, our office manager, usually puts up. She did not pass it along to me to uh, put up this time, but uh, uh, you, if you're really motivated, you can probably go to our website or call our office or, or just, uh, you know, the easy thing to do is maybe send us an email with some of your comments because honestly, every bit of feedback we get helps us in terms of doing a better job and telling uh, potential supporters what we do. So that's all I can say right now. Okay, thank you so much. And... Uh, unless there's anything more, Stacey, you want to add? Um... Nope, I'm good. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Larry. Everybody have a great evening wherever you are. Wonderful. Aloha. Thank you, Stacey, and thank you, Hawaii Wildlife Fund, and thank you all, all of you for participating. Night-night. Night. -night. Night.